Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on the show today. He is, I'm going to get this right, and I'm going to get this right on the first try because we just spent probably about two minutes trying to figure out, what, like, to make sure that I got this right. Western Canada and the Northern Territories Lieutenant for the People's Party of Canada, Kelly Lorenz. Kelly, thank you so much for doing this. Did I get it right? Please tell me I got it right. You, you did, Chris. It was, uh, it was a great job. Awesome. <laughs> it's a it is. Um, but before we get into the nitty gritty of the policies and what your job entitles, anyone who's heard my show before knows what the very first question is going to come out of my mouth is, and it's no exception for you. And that is... Kelly, where does your sense of duty to serve come from? You know what? I, I've been serving the people of Canada pretty much my whole life. Um, I, I'm a veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, I spent a, n- a number of years in the Armed Forces traveling around the world uh, with, with them. Um, I'm an ex-PPCLI, uh, ex-Airborne veteran, so the Airborne Regiment. And then from there, I went to uh, continued into public service with the uh, Federal Corrections in uh, Canada, so the Correctional Services of Canada, working maximum security right down to minimum security. So, really, my role is is been dedicated, or my lifetime has been dedicated to the people of Canada, and ensuring that they're safe and, and and feel secure, and that our rights and freedoms are are safe and secure as well. What brought you to politics? Because that's the the the, 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 the the honest question that has to be asked is, how does a man who was in the military, who went into the corrections, decide, I'm going to get into politics? What was that jump for you? You, you, you know what? It wasn't, um, it was more along the lines of, if, if I don't get involved, uh, I, I'm going to be governed by the people that do decide to get involved, and I'm likely not going to appreciate the results of, of those people governing me. And, and that's exactly where we're at right now. What it is, what it's taking is, is people who have not normally been career politicians getting involved and saying, I want to make a difference. I want to make a change. And that's no different for myself. You ran, uh, I want to make sure I get this right. You ran in Calgary, Nose Hill in 2019. In 2021, you ran for the People's Party, both times in the People's Party of Canada in uh, Red Deer Mountain View, if I'm not mistaken, is the name of the riding. Correct. What, what brought you to the PPC? Because uh, the PPC started in 2019. Maxine Bernier started before that, but it was the first election. So what was your introduction into the People's Party of Canada and why did you decide they best represented your values and your morals going forward? Well, I've been with Maxime and the PPC right from the beginning. I'm one of the founding members of the People's Party of Canada. Um, And what brought me to the People's Party is is really their, their core values, individual freedom, personal responsibility, fairness and respect. And that is what is the basis of the People's Party. Anything beyond that, it's, it's let's have a discussion. And, and that's one of the things that I really, really enjoy when it comes to, to the politics of today is that the fact that we're not having those discussions, we're not having those debates. And, you know, with Maxime, that allows us or allows me the freedom, at least, to have those discussions. Um, so for, for me, as you said, I, I ran in 2019. Uh, it was sort of a trial uh by fire, I jumped in Calgary Nose Hill. I ran against Michelle Rempel uh, at the time. So we all know Michelle and the juggernaut that she was, but that was, for me, that was a, an, an amazing learning experience. Uh, from there, I went in 2021, I ran in Red Deer Mountain View and we, we had a fantastic team and we, we did really, really well. I was quite pleased with the, those numbers. The numbers that we achieved and then from there actually i ran a second campaign right after the federal election and i ran for the alberta senate seat so uh, i'm one of the few people's party of canada candidates that has actually ran uh, in three nominations i want to talk about the 2021 election here because you saw it i saw it i i was on the outside looking in and i saw the um uh, the rallies the support that Maxine was getting, the uh, the attitude shifting from the traditional Alberta conservative voter to opening up to potentially being able to vote for somebody else, because traditionally in Alberta, we are a very conservative province. 
as a candidate, and I want to just add, this is this is your opinion, this is your honest answer, but as a candidate, what was it like on the ground to hear from people willing to say, you know what, you're right, the Conservatives have, uh, haven't been there for us, I want to give it to Maxime Bernier, or was it I like what Maxine Bernier is saying, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put my trust in him in this election. What was it on the ground that people were drawn were being drawn to the PPC? You, you know what uh, they they like the fact uh, what especially what I heard anyways what they like the fact that Maxime and his integrity they they his messaging hasn't changed since since before he started the People's Party of Canada um, his messaging has been consistent and you, you know. I was on, I've spent a lot of time with Maxime on the road and I tell this story quite often. Uh, Maxime is actually the, the, literally the first political leader that I've ever been on the road with or, or spoken with where he's actually told people uh, who have asked him to change his policy platforms, no, I won't change it. And the, the individual said, well, then we can't vote for you. And then Maxime literally said, well, then, then don't vote for me because that, we're not gonna change our policies based off of, of pressure. And for me, that was just that sort of aha moment. Like, this is the type of leader that I want to be involved with. This is the type of leader that I want to work with uh, because of that integrity, because of that strength and, and that conviction, uh, especially within the People's Party. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. How do you best represent your constituents in some sense? Well, like I, like I was saying, what is nice about the People's Party of Canada is that we will not have a party whip. So I'm not going to be forced to, to toe a party line. What I will be held to is the four core values of the People's Party of Canada. As long as candidates follow those, then we're able to represent the people of our riding the way we, uh, the people of our writings want us to represent them. So as long as I follow the individual freedom, personal responsibility, fairness, and respect, then I'm meeting the four core values of the People's Party of Canada. And then anything beyond that, you know, like I said, we're not going to have a toe the party line. Um, we have certain policy platforms that we have to follow that we've committed ourselves to, which we will maintain. But beyond that, you know, uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that this is really and truly representation of the people uh, for the people. And, and I'm allowed to hear what they have to say. So you're saying that there's no whipped votes in your caucus. I just want to make sure that we clarify no, that. because. Yeah, there's no whipped votes. What it is, like I said, if it's a policy platform that that the PPC has a policy platform on, uh, I'll give you an example. Nobody's got a policy platform on abortion. So if we decide to, if somebody brought forward an abortion bill to the House of Commons, then I have the ability to talk to my constituents and vote how my constituents want me to vote on that policy that's currently in front of the House of Commons. I'm not being forced to vote in a certain way, shape, or form, right? As long as I follow the four values, then I can actually listen and talk to to the people of my riding. You've opened which up is different. It is, but you've opened up a little box that I want to play in a little bit. If you're okay with that, for two seconds here, sure. and that is, how do you best represent your constituents? Because I, you, and I both know. No candidate in Canada has ever gotten 100% of the vote in their riding. Never happened. Probably never will. How do you best represent your values and what your constituents want when you have constituents who might have voted Liberal, who might have voted NDP, who might have voted Green, who voted Communist, who voted Marxist-Leninist, who voted Maverick? How do you do that? Because unless you're going out and knock on every single one of your doors, which some writings, it's a pain in the ass, pardon my French, how do you best represent the people when the people don't know what, can't fully decide on what they want either? But you know what, as, as, a, as a candidate or as somebody who's elected, you need to make yourself accessible to those in your writing. 
And when I say accessible, you need to be able to answer the phone calls. You need to be able to answer the emails. You need to be in person, in your writing, having that discussion. You're not going to always agree on everything. And that's why we, Maxime, is very, very, um, very, very strong proponent of, of having that, that debate or that discussion. And that, that doesn't include just in the House of Commons. That includes in your own writing with the, the, the people that you're representing. You got to have that discussion. It, you're, you may not agree. And at the end of the day, uh, on, on uh, like I said, the, the topic, uh, the example was the abortion. My constituents may not fall in line with what my personal values are in that, on that topic. And if my constituents, but I'm one vote in, in my mind when it comes to that. So if, my, if, the, if the consensus is one way or opposite of what my personal beliefs are, in my mind anyways, I'm obligated to represent the people of my riding and that's how I should vote. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. You, you find politicians today that they'll promise the world when they're running for an election, but when they're in office, they'll completely lie to you and give you something else. I've met Maxine. He's been on the show before. He, what he said to me in that interview is the exact same thing I heard when he was out downtown Calgary here during, uh, I think it was September of 2021 before the election started or just right before uh, like the July-ish area. And I was surprised because... Matt, like, if you look at Justin Trudeau, you look at Aaron O'Toole or Candace Bergen now, they'll say something in Ontario, but they won't say the same thing in Alberta. Maxime's different in that way, isn't he? Yeah, Maxime, will, he will say the exact same thing in Quebec as he's saying in Alberta. Uh, you know, and that's what's refreshing. He's not telling you what you, what you want to hear. He's telling you what you need to hear. And, and that's refreshing for a politician, it, it, you know, right now especially in canada canadians need to be told what they need to hear not what we want to hear and and how do we make those changes and maxime is the only leader right now of a federal political party that's standing up for all canadians we've seen it for the last two years over the COVID lockdown maxime's been arrested maxime has been on parliament hill maxime has been there for the truckers you know and that's that's refreshing because you can actually see it. His actions are, are louder than his words. Uh, and far too often we see, especially in the political field right now, is that well, I'm gonna tell you what you wanna hear, but my actions aren't going to meet up with that. You, you have been named the Lieutenant for, yet again, gonna read this off correctly here, Western Canada and the Northern Territories. How did this come about? How did this uh, role, because this role was not something that was in during the last uh, term between 2019 and 2021. This is kind of a new lieutenant role, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Well, this, this isn't really a new in the whole concept of political parties, the conservatives. But whatever. the PPC never had one before. It. Right. You're right. But what this is, is this is a reflection of Maxime's forward thinking, he's recognizing that the, the importance of the leadership roles, expanding on that leadership roles, um, you know, it's also indicative of the growth of the party. We're, we're growing faster than any other political party in the country. And, and you know, it, it's an awful lot to expect an, one individual in Maxime to be able to cover this whole country and be able to answer the questions of our members or those people who have questions of the PPC. And that allows me to get out into the public and still keep the PPC's message um, alive and, and in the public eye and, and, and sort of get across that, you know, the PPC is actually for the people. And you're right, it is a new role for the People's Party. But like I said, this is, um, it's, it's a direct, uh, 
reflection of the leadership, the leadership that Maxime has and the trust that he has within his candidates. You, you've taken on this role, that, which means that you're going to be not only here in Alberta, but you're going to be in BC. I think if I'm not mistaken, you were just in BC a while back. You're going to be traveling mm-hmm. Saskatchewan. Uh, you're going to be going to Manitoba, Northwest Territories, the uh, territories. While this is relatively a new role for you, I think you just took it on earlier this year. What are you hearing? What are you on the ground hearing right now? Because we have, let's I'm just going to put a clock on it, another three years until the next election, depending on if this liberal NDP alliance government or whatever you want to call it, whatever they're calling it, supply management. What are you hearing from Western Canadians and Northern Canadians? You know what? There's a mixture of everything right now. Uh, As you said, I've been traveling to BC. Uh, Matter of fact, this weekend coming up, I'm in Winnipeg. Uh, prior to that, I was in Saskatchewan. Prior to that, I was in Thunder Bay, Ontario. So I'm traveling right across Western Canada and the Northern Territories. Literally, I put on about 25,000 kilometers already since the announcement. So, uh, and when you look at it right now, like I said, next this weekend coming up, I'm in Winnipeg. Next weekend, the following weekend, I'm in BC. And then the following weekend after that, I'm back in Ottawa. So um, a lot of traveling, but I'm hearing the excitement. The people are excited when I get there. Um, it's when they hear the message and they hear some, from somebody else that's within that leadership team, that, that core leadership team, uh, it's invigorating. It, it's keeping people excited. But again, we're here. It, it's, uh, there's a lot of, as you can well imagine from Alberta, there's a lot right now, a lot of that separation sentiment and stuff. Like that. And we have to address that as a party as well. So I'm answering those questions as well, especially here in Alberta. So you've opened the Pandora's box. So let's play inside (laughs) Pandora's box for a few minutes here, if you're okay with that. And that is, what is the PPC's policy or uh, stance on Western autonomy or Western uh, separation? I'm assuming they are the People's Party of Canada and not just the People's Party of provinces that are within Canada. So what is the policy and what is your stance on the the rise of this Western separation movement that we are seeing in Western Canada, particularly Alberta and Saskatchewan? Well, you know what? I'm like every other political party out there right now. Maxime has, has faced this head on, obviously coming from Quebec, and we're, we're addressing it. We, we believe that Albertans and the people of Saskatchewan, if they want to vote on a referendum on separation, then absolutely have that vote. But it's not as simple as everybody seems to think, oh, we're going to win it, we're going to vote, we're going to win it, and we're going to be gone, because it's not as simple as that. So understanding the process that takes in order to secede from Canada is actually paramount. But what Maxime wants is to have decentralization of government. He wants a smaller government. He wants the provinces to have that autonomy from Ottawa and allow the provinces to be accountable to the people of their province. So... Really, that, that if, if we look at it, the People's Party is already putting that in play for that autonomous relationship with Ottawa, uh, should we be elected? And it, as far as I'm concerned, that's a win-win situation for not only uh, the, the people, of, uh, the government of Ottawa, but the provinces, because now all of a sudden you have that, that separation and you're able to do the things and that accountability is there provincially. And as you're well aware, federal, especially with the federal government right now, the, the micromanaging, the, uh, the federal government interference is growing and growing and growing. And it seems to never be never ending. Uh, and like I said, Maxime wants smaller government and, and that's important. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. That's a lot of downloading and I'm just going to I'm going to mm-hmm. challenge you here because that's what the great thing about the show is because my listeners are listening to this right now and saying why aren't you asking this question if they're driving on the deer foot or why aren't you asking this question well it's my show start your own show and have people on they can do ask the <laughs> questions um, but 
that's a lot of downloading onto the provinces. Do you think the provinces are uh, are prepared to potentially pick up a lot of like policing, uh, collecting their own taxes? Because I know that's what Jason Kenney and the UCP wanted to do. I know Jason Kenney is now out, but right now the UCP seem to be a little bit more taking back from Ottawa what they can do here and like Quebec has done. Are provinces ready, do you believe? Or are you talking to people in the provinces that are saying, you know what? We can do it. If Quebec can do it, we can do it out here as well. You know what? But that's exactly what everybody's looking for. They want that same sort of lifestyle. They say, want that same sort of advantage that Quebec has. Uh, and, and But Quebec isn't a part of the Constitution. They never signed the Constitution. So what I challenge literally everybody with is the Constitution was signed in 1982. So we've had successive governments of conservative, NDP, what have you, uh, across Canada, why hasn't any provincial government, so they all said that they want to do it, take advantage of the constitution, but yet none of them have. And so why? You know, Maxime is, is very, very clear. If you want to take advantage of the constitution, the things under the constitution, then do that. That's that's how you create, create that autonomy from Ottawa. So, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's an important step uh, and this goes back to what I was saying, where uh, po career politicians are, are telling you what you want to hear and not telling you what you need to hear. And so we're not asking those difficult questions as well. We will talk about a, a, two certain career politicians in a few minutes here as well. But I want to stick on what you're hearing from Canadians and while you're touring, while you're talking to them. You talked about policies. You talked about that Western autonomy. Are there certain issues that have come up that you've been surprised at? You go, whoa, I didn't expect to hear this in BC or I didn't expect to hear about this issue in Saskatchewan. Are there issues that you, you've started to look at in a different lens by saying, okay, maybe the Alberta bubble that is sort of known as Western Canada is Alberta for people in Eastern Canada. But when you get outside of Alberta and you actually talk to people in BC, they have similar issues, but they have kind of different Western issues that they have to address as well. Are you hearing things that you've been surprised at? No, you know what? It's been pretty consistent across the board, right from oh, really? Thunder Bay. Yeah, right from Thunder Bay uh, all the way to BC. It's it's been fairly consistent, which actually that surprised me. Um, you know, everything that uh, people are addressing in Saskatchewan, uh, people in BC are still talking about. Uh, with you, know, well, I don't want to know what open up another Pandora's box here, but when you talk about transgenderism or what have you, people are still having those discussions. It's just in some areas like BC. Those, those topics are more sensitive than they are in Saskatchewan or Alberta because in Alberta or Saskatchewan, they're looking for that fair deal. Right? And, and just um, on that note, just to, just to be there, it's an issue across the province, across the country. If you go to rural Tor Ontario and then go to downtown Toronto, the transgender, uh, the uh, not issue, but the, 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 uh, the, what's the word I want to use here correctly? Um, the talk around transgender rights is very much prevalent and it's not just a open and shut case it seems like it should be but for some people but it's not just a western issue it's not where oh westerns are having a fair deal but anyway that's here another i'll continue on with my line of conversations <laughs> we'll get into that pandora's box because even i'm getting tripped up here thanks kelly <laughs> thanks <laughs> I want to talk about one thing that the federal government has announced recently, and I'm assuming you have lots to say on it because uh, I, I read your bio and you are a gunman yourself, and I am as well. The, the federal gun legislation, but not legislation, the stopping of importing of handguns and selling of handguns and transferring handguns, I, like it was a very confusing announcement that they made. What's the PPC's policy on uh, firearm legislation, and what are you hearing from all uh, Western Canadians and Northern Can uh, Northern Territory Canadians about firearms? Well, as, as you're well aware, that firearms are important to to Canadians, whether it's hunters or sport shooting. Uh, I do both myself, so uh, it's obviously very very important. The People's Party of Canada believes that firearms should be property and they should be considered as such. 
But when you have announcements such as this gun legislation that the, the government has just recently brought out, when I'm talking to, to especially the people of Western Canada uh, and the Northern Territories, it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, the whole purpose of, if, if I'm understanding the Trudeau government in that right now, is that this is supposed to address crime and the issues related to crime. And based off of my experience, this is going to do absolutely nothing to address the, the underlying issues when it comes to crime. This is purely punitive against legal firearm owners and, and restricting them even further in a process that's a very, already very, very uh, restrictive. You have to go through a long process in order to get your restricted firearms license um, and in order to maintain that license. And, and you know, it, 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 it's based off of misinformation that the Trudeau government is expanding these restrictions. Um, like is I it say, overstep? Is it overstep from the federal government to, because I, correct me if I'm wrong here, because yet again, I, I went to get my PAL license because my mother has guns and I'm I'm going to be the heir apparent in that situation once she does pass yeah. away, uh, hopefully long time from now. So it's not like I go shooting on a regular basis, but I have gone sports shooting and I wanted to get it because, well, I, I heard once you come to Alberta, it's kind of like get your driver's license, get your PAL license in that order. Mm -hmm. So I got it. I want to know is and is this overreach from the federal government into a provincial issue, in your opinion? It, you know what? It's overreach uh, in, in so many different areas, in, in my mind. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a government that's trying to, in my opinion, disarm its citizens rather than really taking a, an honest look at the issues with related to crime. Um, and it, it it's going to it's not going to achieve what they think it's going to achieve. Uh, you know, everything that I've heard so far, I mean, as I said to you at the, at the beginning, I, I've worked in federal corrections for 14 years. I worked maximum security down to minimum security. And I can tell you, I've never, ever run into an offender in federal corrections that was in jail for using their legal firearms in the in the in in their crimes you know it, it's it's the illegal firearms that we need to be addressing or, or looking at but if we're if we're seriously looking at addressing the issues of crime and, and everything surrounding that then we need to take a look at the underlying issues of crime getting back to family and community are two of the major things that we need to do as a country and we're, we're just totally it's for me it's almost like a distraction because i'm going to take away the firearms from you and people are focusing on crime and the issues related to crime simply because the federal government is trying so hard to remove us from that family unit and that community unit and they're they're creating silos between people what do you mean by that I just want to clarify, clarify what do you mean by the federal government is taking because I, I'm just honestly questioning that because I was like, I, I've never seen something like that. But if I want to know what your opinion on what you mean by the federal government is trying to take uh, the family away. Well, it's not that they're trying to take the family away, but what it is, is it's a distraction, right? If you're trying to address the underlying issues related to crime, we need to look at we need to look at family issues. We need to look at the community issues. We need to under, understand addiction and why the addictions are, people are, are in addiction, the mental health issues, all of these things, the government is easily avoiding this, right? They're saying that their, their answer to crime is to take away the firearms, but they're taking them away from legal firearm owners. When, you know, if, if you look at the statistics, I, I looked at the statistics in 2019 prior to the election, and at, I believe at that time, it was almost 97% of all legal firearms were coming through Toronto, which was Bill Blair's riding as a police chief. I was going to say, as the police chief, Bill Blair, yeah. So, you know, sort of hypocritical. You're, you're trying to address crime and, and public safety, but you're going after legal firearm owners, yet 97% of illegal firearms are coming through your own your own writing, your own district. Your own, yeah. Mm. 
Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. It seems very hypocritical, but I haven't I sat down and actually read the full report. I've read uh, the synopsis that the federal government sends out to the media once they actually introduce this thing. Uh, but I, I agree. You, legal firearm owners, I, the majority of them, I'd say the large majority of like 99.9% .9 know how to use a weapon correctly. Some might get drunk and stupidly do something, but I'm not, I'm not saying that all firearm owners are bad. That's my two cents on that. It's the illegal guns that are in Canada that we need to tackle. And it's an issue that it seems like this government is not taking serious enough. So let's start cracking down on that. And I'd be a happy camper. So let's, Justin Trudeau, if you're listening to this, I know you probably don't, but let's let's smarten your head up and let's get this party started. But you're exactly right. It's not the legal firearm owners that are, are the issue. And that's, that's clear. Uh, you know, we're going into a further, uh, the, the, the long gun registry that was proven to be a huge failure way back years ago. Uh, there's nothing obligating me to to register my 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 firearms, my long my long guns. So will I? I probably won't. Why would I? Uh, it's just another overreach by the government into the lives of, of Canadians. Uh, when Canadians are just right now, they're struggling to just get by. Okay, now you you just said something that I guarantee someone's going to be sending me an email about the moment this airs. Well, you don't have to register your gun. Well, you have to register your car, though, and cars cause accidents, cars kill people. So why shouldn't we just register our car and register a gun? And I know we're getting away from the PPC. It's just I want to I want to know from a firearm person who sport hunts and who uses it for sports what your response to that is. If you want to talk about it, if not, just let me know and we'll continue on. You know what, though, it's not really getting away from the PPC's platform on, on firearms, because like I said at the, at the beginning, the PPC's, the PPC's uh, platform on firearms is, is saying that we already have a lot of steps or processes in place to ensure that legal firearm owners are following the, the proper procedures, are following the proper rules, you know, and so why do we need to expand on that? We, we know already that is the, the issue isn't the legal firearm owners, it's the illegal firearms. So when you, when you buy a rifle, for example, and it's, it's uh, the registration or the bill of sale as well as sent to the RCMP uh, in the Miramichi, I believe it is, you get a card in the mail that says that this firearm was purchased by you and this is the make, model, and the caliber of the rifle. Why would I need to go back to the police and and re, you know, register a firearm that they're already aware of because I had to follow the process to begin with? And it's not. And just to piggyback on that, it's not like the moment you get your PAL license, that's it, you're done. You have to go no. for training. It's it does expire, and you do get uh, checked into. So you might not be knowing you get checked into with guns, if I'm not mistaken, but. They do do, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong here, Kelly, but they do do uh, check-ins to say, okay, has there been any medical issues that have been going on in this person's life to ensure that he is still a, uh, uh, they, he is still safe to own these guns, correct? There's extensive background checks. Exactly, and, yeah. And, you know, I mean, uh, there's even a background check uh, if you get divorced. Yep. There's even a background check where they actually talk to your ex-spouse to see that they, they don't feel threatened by you owning a firearm. So these steps are redundant and they're redundant for a reason is to ensure the safety of, uh, and security of Canadians. So, like I said, I don't understand the additional overreach by the federal government uh, in, into these areas. And, and again, it, it's that misinformation that they're, they're giving to Canadians with regards to certain types of weapons and and uh, and calibers of weapons. Okay, Kelly, we're going to talk about the biggest <laughs> issue that is happening across this province or this country right now, and that is travel restrictions. 
I can imagine uh, as the uh, lieutenant for the uh, the leader who got arrested for travel restrictions and breaking COVID protocols, while we can talk about COVID, I want to talk about travel restrictions right now. And I know they go hand in hand, but I don't want to go down that path because that's, that's another four hour conversation in itself. Yeah. So let's talk about travel restrictions. When you're crossing the country, are you hearing from Canadians who are pissed off or upset about the current government's handling of how they're not or how the current government is not allowing some Canadians to get on airplanes or travel from point A to point B because they did not get the vaccination? Well, you know what? Like you said, I've been traveling across this country. Uh, I've driven probably twice across it already since the announcement with Maxime. And Canadians are angry. They're very, very upset. And, and you know something for, for me, it's almost a win-win for me because if I was allowed to fly, I wouldn't be able to talk to those Canadians that are, are angry about everything that else, everything else that's going on. So it, it, I get to talk to the Canadians. I get to hear what their, their issues are. Yes, they're angry because it, it doesn't make any sense to them. You know, uh, every other country in the world has allowed their, their citizens to, to travel across within their own country, travel border, across borders with flight, except for Canada. And, you know, a, a, reasonable, a reasonable person would go, why? Like, that it just doesn't add up. So it's that common sense element. And I hate saying that when it comes to politics here and having that common sense option, but you know, this is why, why Maxime and the People's Party are doing what we do because we believe in personal responsibility. If I'm sick, then I should stay home. Individual freedom, I should have that right to travel across the country and fly at, or whatever is most convenient for myself. Uh, you know, the, and of course the freedom and, and we're losing that. And that's one of the reasons why Maxime and myself and the rest of the, the lieutenants are standing up for, for Canadians and saying enough, we need to get back to what Canada was prior to COVID and we need to start growing our economy. And, and this, uh, it, it's got a global effect. Even the, the travel restrictions itself has a, a global effect for Canadians. I, I'm one to always look at the silver lining in situations like this. You, you say you, you, you've you been driving across Ca uh, Western mm -hmm. Canada. You get to meet with a lot of different Canadians that you may not be able to meet with if you just stop in, say, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Thunder Bay. But you're going to probably, you're traveling through places like Estevan and Ed, or like Slave Lake if you're going up north or uh, like Chilliwack in uh uh, BC. So you're getting to see the, I don't want to say true Canadians because everyone's a true Canadian at the end of the day, but you're getting to see the Canadians that are see, that to often get forgotten about on political campaigns or during leadership tours where, oh, I'll go to the big centers and I won't talk to the people outside. Does that give you a different perspective when you're talking to Maxine Bernier and say, you know what? It's great that we're talking to people in Vancouver, but the people up in uh, Fort Williams, up in BC, are having issues that we need to address as well. The people up in Prince Albert are having issues. So does that give you a different perspective when you're dealing with uh, a, a party like the People's Party and growing the party because you're maybe attending these places that seem to often get forgotten about by other political parties? Well, you know, that's what's nice about Maxime announcing the, the lieutenant role. It allows me to get to all of these smaller areas where, like you said, a, a political leader typically wouldn't, wouldn't go to during a, a, an official campaign. But what I found even more um, invigorating, more uh, got my, my blood going was the fact that Maxime himself said that he wanted to go to these areas, these smaller towns where he couldn't typically visit during a campaign. And he wanted to talk, talk to these people and hear what they have to say, because you're right, they often do get forgotten. I've spent time up in uh, Northern Saskatchewan, Prince Albert and, and North. Uh, I'm gonna go up to Prince George. Uh, I'm hitting the small towns on, the, on Vancouver Island. So 
and, and I know Maxime wants to go with me and in, in two of those same places. And when I talk to people, when they call me on the phone and they say, Kelly, we'd like you to come to our small town. And I say, absolutely. Not only are they, they're overjoyed, they're, they're thrilled, they can't wait, but it, they, they're very, very quick to say, you know what, nobody else has said yes. So, I mean, you look at the recent tours, no, I mean, other leadership tours or whatever's going on with, uh, within other parties, they're staying within their comfort zone of major centers. They're not going to these small towns. And Ontario and, and Quebec. It doesn't seem like they're getting out of Ontario and Quebec anytime soon. Let's be, let's put it that on the table too. Well, that, I mean, but the, you have to ask yourself why. And that's one of the things I, I, I really admire about Maxime. And uh, as you're probably aware, he just finished his North, uh, his Atlantic Canada tour. Uh, and they hit smaller venues and they hit smaller towns and, and talk to the people and, and, the people there, it grew the party even more because people found confidence in a leader in Maxime Bernier that was willing to come and actually just listen. One of the biggest things that when I'm touring and I'm talking to our candidates and I'm helping them understand what it takes to be a candidate for the People's Party, I, I get them to understand that, you know what, you need to listen, you, not just not just listen, but hear. You need to hear what people are telling you, so you're able to relate, relate from them to Maxime or myself what the issues are for the people in these towns, and you learn so much from that. So, Maxime is is actually hearing. He's not just listening. He's actually hearing what people have to say, and for me, uh, that's vital. And for the people of Canada, uh, that just shows that the PPC really is the people's party. I want to turn because I just looked at the clock and we're 40 minutes in. And I said we'd be 40 minutes, but hey, we got a few minutes if you're okay with that, Kelly, are you? I'm, I'm good, whenever. Uh, awesome, awesome. I want to talk about the narrative right now in the sort of legacy media, and I hate using that word, but let's say CBC, CTV, that... A certain politician on the Conservative Party of Canada's leadership, Pierre Polyev, who I have assigned in just because I'm a political collector, if, if you haven't <laughs> noticed, um, is taking back some of that PPC vote because he is talking about the core of principles that the PPC has, of principle, of respect, of freedom, of uh, respect. What do you have to say to that? Do you do you agree with that? Do you believe that the PPC is actually struggling? Or you, you've told me that they're growing, but is Pierre Polyev taking back some of that PPC vote that you gained in the last election? Or is it just the media BSing us again? No, you know what? I think what it is is Pierre, even, well, even Pierre and other members of the conservative leadership race recognize that what the PPC is saying it is resonating with conservatives and it's resonating with Canadians. I mean, Maxime ran on this exact same platform when he ran for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. And at the time he was at a little over 50%, I believe, uh, in the leadership race, he was winning the leadership race with this policy platform. So it obviously resonates with, with conservatives, it resonates with Canadians. Now, it comes down to what I was speaking about previously. Actions speak louder than words. So right now he's telling the people what they what they want to hear from the Conservative Party of Canada. But the, the real question, the real challenge comes afterwards, depending on who wins, is will he be able to follow through with it? And my personal opinion is I don't believe he will because it, it comes at a cost, right? Especially for the Conservative Party of Canada. Uh, it, when it comes to the People's Party of Canada and and our policy platforms, honestly, uh, people taking our material or using our policy platforms, that's flattery in my mind, because that just shows that we're on the right path, right? That our messaging within the People's Party makes sense and, and people are using that. And, and you know what, it's, it's gonna help us grow. Are, are we concerned? I, I personally am not concerned. Um, it just helps me when I'm talking to people. Yes, I understand that there's a leadership race and the People's Party, like I said, the People's Party's platform 
makes sense. It makes sense for Canadians. It doesn't matter what political party you you choose to support at this point. So I want to wrap up with this question here, and that is what's next? I know we've talked about the tour that you're going to be going on to Vancouver to Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, then back to Thunder Bay, <laughs> which I still haven't asked the question. Why is the Western Canadian and Northern Territories lieutenant in Thunder Bay? Wouldn't that be the Ontario lieutenant? Or does Thunder Bay, is Thunder Bay considered Western Canada because it's in Ontario? No, Thunder Bay actually just has more in common with the Western Canadian element than our Western Canada than than actual Ontario. It's just the positioning of it. It allows me to get there or access the teams there and assist them uh, easier than actually our, our, our Ontario lieutenant. Uh, not to take away anything from our Ontario lieutenant, but it. I remember driving to Ottawa uh, just recently and I was driving beside Lake Superior uh, and I couldn't believe it. For two days, I had Lake Superior to my right hand side. I was like, oh my God. So, you know, it's massive. It's a massive province. And so this is just a way of, of us being able to, uh, to help our teams in Thunder Bay, help our candidates in Thunder Bay and, and maintain that consistent and consistent messaging and have that leadership role within, within the Thunder Bay area. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying that. I should have asked that beforehand because you kept on saying Thunder Bay. I was like, that's in Ontario, isn't it? Then I remember I remember doing that drive when I moved out to Alberta and I went, I'm never doing this drive again. Then I did it three more times afterwards. And I'm, <laughs> I keep on saying to myself, never again, but I always love it. It's a beautiful well, country. You know, it is. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. I mean, I, I could have gone through the States, but obviously I'm not vaccinated, so I can't go through the States. But so, but I wouldn't have anyways. I enjoy going through Canada. I get to see the beauty, that everything that Canada has to offer, and the and the beauty, and you know, it. I get to talk to Canadians, and and I get to hear the perspective from Canadians. And like I said, uh, I'm going to BC in in two weeks, and then I'm driving back to Ottawa. Um, I'm 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 actually marching into Ottawa with James Top the last 160 kilometers. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah, so, um, but at the end of the day, it, it just affords me the opportunity to, to meet Canadians and, and, you know, nothing more exciting than that, to be honest with you. Have you been welcomed by Canadians? Because usually when people hear a politician's coming or a lieutenant for a political party come, is coming, there's apathy because I think, and I, this could be, I could be speaking at a turn here and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're talking to Canadians, I'm talking to people who are talking to Canadians. Apathy in this country is so low right now when it comes to politics. Yes, there's people who do like the Freedom Convoy who went from BC to Canada, but the apathy of the other 37 million is just so, in my opinion, sad. Are you being welcomed when you're talking to people? Are people opening up their ears? Because that's the one thing I've always tried to pride myself on in this show is talking to people and doesn't matter who they are. A Canadian is a Canadian to me. If you're in Nova Scotia, you're in Alberta, you're in BC, you're up in Northwest Territories. I love talking to people. Are people willing to talk to politicians today? You know what? Everybody that I've run into has been excited to talk to me. Uh, I'm actually surprised because you're absolutely right. The people are tired of career politicians coming through and, and basically, you know, talking and not following through. Uh, one of the advantages, like I said, that I have is that I'm not that career politician. I'm an everyday, I was going to work Monday to Friday or every, you know, seven days a week, depending on the job and, and you know, sacrificing for Canadians and when you talk to them about your background and they understand, boy, they get excited to talk to you. They want to hear what you have to say. The, the fact that you're involved, the fact that you're with the leadership. And, and you said it just, just now. And Maxima said it time and time again. I don't care if you're this, that, or the other. As long as you're Canadian, then, you know, I appreciate you. As long as you are Canadian and you're happy, then I'm going to fight for you. And that's what I love about Maxima and the PPC. Um, 
Kelly, my last question is this. When can we expect to see Maxine out here in Alberta? Because we'd love to have him on the show. We'd love to get out and tour with him, get some photos of him in action. When's he coming to Alberta as lieutenant for Western Canada and Northern <laughs> Territories? You should know. <laughs> You're right. I should know, but I don't know at this point right now because, again, Maxime can't fly uh, because Maxime's not not vaccinated. Um, we all know. Well, it takes me almost three days, four days to go from Ottawa to to Red Deer, so it's a long drive. So um, you know, once Maxime and I finish the tour, because I'll be on the on the road with Maxime while he's touring Western Canada he's still got another three days, four days of driving after the tour is done. So we're going to take a look at it. We're trying to get Maxime out here, uh, hopefully this summer. Better be um, for Stampede. At, <laughs> well, you know what? Stampede's an exciting time. We've got, I, I, we got lots of plans for Stampede and, and getting involved. But my hope is to bring out the other lieutenants um, it, to Alberta so we can introduce the Western, Western Canada to the other lieutenants and, and just show that how united this party is and, and how much we're growing. But you know what? I, we're, we're trying. I, I don't know. I don't have that answer right now. I wish I did. No, I, I appreciate it. I put you on the spot there. But Kelly, I want to thank you so much for this conversation. I enjoy talking to people like yourself who are passionate about politics, who are passionate about Canada and passionate about their views that they hold. And you are that. And I give you credit because I think we need more people who are passionate about that politics, policy, Canada in politics. So thank you. Oh, thank you. You know what? I, I, I love what I do. Uh, I, I, I do it full time right now for Maxime. And I love it. I love meeting Canadians. I love working for Canadians. And you know what? I, I'm here to listen to you. And to listen to you, people need to reach out to you. So how can they do that? How can people reach out to you? And instead of listing off like your email address and phone numbers and all that, if you just tell us where they can and then just supply me with the information. I'll put it in the show notes so that way they can just click on the link so that way they're not trying to scribble down what the information is. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. There's a couple options. You can go to the People's Party of Canada.ca. So our, our national website, I'll be under, uh, on that site under the regional lieutenants. Um, or you can go to my own personal website, is Kelly for Alberta. So the number for Alberta.ca. And you'll be able to reach me there as well. And yeah, I, I, I answer all my emails. So uh, reach out, ask the questions. If you want me out in, in your area, I'd love to come. I, I don't care where it is. I don't care how long of a drive it is. Uh, if you want me there, then, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up. Kelly, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Um, for that, this has been the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, get out from behind social media. I know that's a weird concept in today's age. And go have a conversation with somebody. It does help our democracy. It does help our country. And it makes us a better society. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, keep talking. Keep talking.